they just have come from there and then they take the brother's writing because that would be a very good one. Because time is short, maybe just one more minute to work on that, please. Anything you want to share? What pressures you come up with? that becomes the pressure. Where did you buy that from? What brand are you wearing? Because if you're not wearing the cool brand, no one likes what you're wearing. So whether it's Banana Republic or The Gap, or there's different names of different stores these days. If you go to Square One in Mississauga, there's 10 new stores. I don't know what they're called anymore. When I was growing up, it was Stitches. If it was from Stitches, it was cool. If it was from Sears or The Bay, then you're not cool, right? And growing up, shoes. Shoes make a big difference as well. When I was growing up again, Dr. Martens, Doc Martens they were called, or Docs. They're a special type of shoe that everybody used to wear. If you didn't wear Docs, you weren't cool. As adults, the name of the number one uh, brand for adults in the workplace? Clarks. Clarks, Clarks is, the, is actually is the brand, right, for, you know, they'll actually ask you. People ask me what kind of shoes you're wearing, and I'll say some no names, like, oh, okay, they won't talk to you anymore. <laughs> if you say Clarks, even if you lie about it, a whole conversation opens up. Oh, where'd you go? Which store did you go? It was on sale. Which model is it? And watch pieces, right? What are you wearing on your hand? Right? How expensive is it? What does it look like? What's the face look like? Is it from, you know, where, where, is, it, where is it made? What movement, here's the question, what movement is your watch? I had no idea what this meant, but kids talk about it as well. Rolex has its own movement, right? Samsung has its own movement, right? And uh, Citizen has its own movement. Right? These are different movements in the actual clock itself, and that makes a difference. So these are some of the social pressures uh, in, in terms of community. Uh, and sister also mentioned TV shows, right? Again, TV shows play a big, a big role in what kids, what kids are watching. Not only TV shows, but YouTube channels, right? Does anybody know what the number one uh, YouTube channel right now for kids? He has 25 million followers. <coughs> Jay Paul? Jay Paul, you're saying Jay Paul? Not, not sure that one is, okay, Jay Paul is one of them. The other one I'm thinking about, yeah? Logan Paul. Who? Logan Paul. Logan Paul, okay. The other one is called guava juice. You guys heard of guava juice? You don't like him too much? Okay. Maybe he's for younger kids, but guava juice has 25 million followers. So in elementary school, they're constantly talking to each other about... Uh... <laughs> oh, okay. So we're going to take a break at this time. Okay, so, so guava juice is another example of a, of a social pressure that you watched the video that was there the night before. Okay. Is there any other pressures regarding... At home, what are some of the home pressures that may exist? Cleaning washroom. Clean, clean up. Cleaning up the washroom. If you don't clean up the washroom, you don't clean up the house, you don't vacuum. Quran. You must recite Quran at home. That's a, that's a pressure. If you're not reciting Quran, you're not praying, that can cause a pressure as well. Right? There's a father who takes away the uh, video game system if his son or daughter don't pray. Marks? School marks, absolutely. Especially if you have siblings in the home and you're competing with each other, there's a social pressure right there. I have to do just as well as my brother or sister. You can you imagine having twins in the home, and they're competing against each other, and they're twins? That also is another pressure exists in the home. Also in the same sense, there's a pressure when the parents are favoring one child, right? So social pressure regarding favorites of one child, absolutely, which may result from marks, behavior, uh, the way they look, the way that they're cleaning up in the house, or your sister always cleans up the house. How come you don't? I'm making her like Halim and Nahari, and you're getting no, Kellogg's cereal for dinner, right? That's the that's social pressure that can exist in the home. Absolutely. Okay, so we're gonna break for Isha at this time, and then we'll, we'll come back to each other. But reality is the reason why we have peer pressure or social pressures and the anxieties related is because we live in a society. And by living in a society, we're exposed to other people. We're exposed to people who are different than ourselves. 
And sometimes parents wish they could just put their kid in jail or put them inside of a cave and live like a hermit to protect them from the outside world. And parents often will wish that they could just put their child into a closet and protect them as much as possible from all the, uh, the wild issues that exist with the society. But the truth is that we cannot lock our kids into a closet. We know this. We know that we have to interact uh, with the society itself. And we need to become just more aware of what those pressures are. And understanding that those pressures exist from the time that our child is born well into their adulthood. And we as adults are aware of the pressures that we may also be facing as well. Right? Some of the pressures in the adult world might be you know, dealing with marriage. Even getting married for those in their mid-20s or late-20s, getting married is also a pressure. And for those of us who are married, those are the in-laws. They're always a pressure, aren't they? Right? You can laugh about that because they're not here, right? <laughs> we hope. <laughs> but that's always a pressure, right? So this, the pressure will continue to exist. So we cannot escape from them. But what can we do? Is to understand that we all have been born, we have all been created with an innate uh, intention, an innate idea or characteristic that we cannot be alone, right? Uh, we all have a need to belong to a greater collective. And we see this in our in the actions and the du'a of our own father, Adam alayhi salam, when he asked for a zawj, when he asked for a pairing, a twinning, a two, he wanted somebody else to share this life with. It was not, he was not satisfied living this life alone. And so through that example, we see that belonging to a greater collective is very essential for our well-being. We also understand that we have to have a sense of interdependency, right? That we are not alone in this universe. We're constantly looking for extraterrestrial life. NASA would not exist, right? In, in, in this country, we have something called SPAR, which is a private company very similar to NASA. These would not exist. SPAR is responsible for creating the Canada Arm that we have so proudly displayed. We have two of them now on the International Space Station. When kids are young, when adults are older, we're always entranced and intrigued by life out there, beyond the Earth. Which is why we're always looking at Mars and Venus and outside of our solar system. And we go so thrilled when we find that there's a comet or asteroid near us. You know, all these movies that they make on these topics are very you know, intrinsic a part of our development as a human species. That we don't want to be alone. And the third is to develop a purpose for existence. Right? This is why society is so important. This is why these pressures are so important. It's because out of those pressures, and I think about this, how do you make a diamond? Pressure on, pressure on coal. When coal is pressured enough, you get a diamond. The same thing for us as human beings, especially for our young ones. With enough pressure and a bit of molding, our children shall will become diamonds. And so it's important for us not to run away from these pressures, but to understand that through these pressures, we can shape and mold and help develop our children so they can also become diamonds as well. And that is by helping them to develop that purpose as to why we exist, right? And why we exist. And so I'll let this to Dr. Faisal so talk more about that. It's interesting, uh, first of all, when you talk about the pressures of existence, they are not isolated to Muslim kids. The not Muslim kids also have the same pressures. Everything you're seeing here is actually the same perspective for the kids who are not Muslim. So when I talk to kids, and there's a few of them that come to the maktab here, I don't come around telling them about Islam. I first talk to them about who created you? Where did you come from? What is the nature of the I? And Having a physician background, it's kind of easy for me. And I can say the insides of you are all so complicated because you have no idea how that burger becomes what you see in the washroom. It sounds gross, but it actually gives them the idea. And the more you probe with them these concepts, the more you bring into their heart the conversation. Because remember, the Prophet has said, Fitra, right? The human nature wants to know, what am I doing here? Look at the atheists. Look at the atheists of our time. They have the existential question as the biggest issue that occurs for them. They have no idea how to answer them. But here, we have been told by Allah, look, you and me have a remembrance of Allah as the primary reason for our existence, right? Primary reason. Allah actually has answered that question already. Do you think that we complicated, we created this complicated human being for habas, for no purpose at all? No purpose at all? How is that possible? It doesn't have to be a big complex. Like I said again and again, I don't want your and my conversation to become so complex that the kids really don't know what you're talking about. You simply look at a cell phone. That's what I use all the time. Do you think this thing can, can come about by itself? Do you think it's possible? 
And the kids are very smart. They will very quickly tell you it's not possible. And yet I will tell them, but all the contents of the cell phone are actually present in the desert of Arabia. You have plastic, you have silicon, that's where plastic came from. You have oil, that's where plastic came from. And you have desert sand, which is where uh, uh, the chip came from. So where is this idea of occurrence of existence without a planner coming from? It's not possible. So creation, creator. Design, designer. And then you come into the organization. I highly recommend that we introduce Quran into our kids' life very early on. You know, when you say, Qul huwa Allah huwa ahad, there is nothing that can come to that. Nothing. Bring in the concept to say, Who wrote this Quran? Who wrote the Quran? Ask them. Let them talk to you. They have ideas, right? They will say, Tell them. This was written by people who read and wrote at the instructions of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. This is a question that occurs to Christians also. If you don't believe that Muhammad peace be upon him is a messenger, how come he came up with this document that describes on one side the astronomy, on the other side it describes the unborn embryo. Where did this come from? How did it predict some of the things that we are seeing now? Like for example, the Quran has said, you will be identified by your fingertips, by your fingerprint. Kids are absolutely mesmerized when you bring up this information, provided you have it of course, you'll be amazed. You can actually create a dialogue with them. Peer pressure, bullying, right? There's bullying in the Quran. Anybody want to take this on? Where is bullying described? Mashallah, the youngest one. Yes? Say again. Yusuf alayhi salam. Mashallah, right? His brothers are big time pushing him around. In fact, they push him into a well. Yes? That's peer pressure. That's peer pressure right there for you. It may not be peer pressure from the outside, it's right? peer pressure from the inside. Dakhla. A man came to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and said, and this is what, I, I use this because I use this for our children and for myself. It's too much, Dad. You've got too much information. You're 60, you know all the stuff. I can't figure it all out. That's exactly what the Prophet ﷺ was actually given. One of the men, the Baddus, the, if you like, the regular guys like me, came up and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, the laws of Islam have become too much for us. Give us a means of access to something that we can actually cling to, which means we can deal with this easily. I can't read the whole Quran. I have not the time. Tell them, don't forget Allah. The simplest concept is to imagine a camera that is watching you 24 hours. It's not that hard. The idea of CCTV is not lost on the kids. The idea of online observation of you is not that hard. You already have held all the concepts. All you need to do is, how would you like all of your life to be discussed in front of the whole humanity? How would you like that to happen? Remember that we already talked about friends will become enemies. Why? Well, because they've now got a bigger problem. A bigger problem. It sounds complex. Actually, kids love the idea when you introduce the idea of accountability. And it has to come in gently. It cannot come in like the severe methodology that sometimes some parents decide to do. I hope this is something that's making sense to all of us. So at this point, we have talked about what is peer pressure. We've had a chance to share ideas about where peer pressure exists. We've explored social peer pressure along with social anxieties and social pressures as well. We've understood the need for pressure to exist and the fact that we cannot escape it. So now the question is, what do we actually do? What are we going to do with this concept? What are we actually going to do to help our kids and help ourselves deal with the peer pressure? So the first is to acknowledge Sorry, just you need that where it is right there. It's okay, this is a different file, it's a different file, it's okay. <laughs> so first is to acknowledge that peer pressure and social pressure actually exist. You see, when kids understand that, or sorry, when kids can see that their parents understand where they're coming from, they're more likely to open up. So it's important for us to take away this phrase, parents just don't understand. It's a common phrase that teenagers will just say, that parents just don't understand. My mom and dad, they don't understand what I'm going through. They don't understand what it's like to be in school these days. They don't understand what it's like to have to go on Snapchat 24-7. They don't understand what it means to be posting on Instagram all the time. Mom and dad still watch Facebook. My God, that's so old. What's wrong with them? Right? Twitter? Who does Twitter these days? It's all about Snapchat. So, if we can share with our kids that we know where they're coming from, that we have shared the same experience that we too we're once 14, 15, and 16 years old, then we can start reaching out to them. You know, imagine ourselves asking the question, I wonder how I would react to this pressure. 
and we start to invite a conversation for our teens to partake in with us as well. Imagine going home tonight and taking this worksheet and showing to your teenager and say, look what I did. I just spent two hours learning about you and what life was like for you. And you know what? I learned something. And I'm sorry that I'm not being there for you this entire time, but I will be there for you moving forward. Or if your kids are young, you say, Alhamdulillah, I spent two hours preparing for the time that you're going to become a teenager. Let's start right now. Or it might be, you know what? You just started grade nine. I'm glad I went there tonight because now we can start together. Wherever stage is your, your children are in, it's never too late to engage with them. That's the point I'm trying to make. So let's start by looking at shared experiences. Okay, so on your handout on the second page, you'll find a chart there. Your parents and siblings, your friends in school, and your workplace. So I'd like you to take a moment and list for yourself what peer pressures, what social pressures did you experience when you were growing up with your family or with your siblings, your parents? What pressures did you feel when you were at school with your friends? And what pressures do you experience right now in the workplace or maybe in the past workplace as well? So please take some time to fill this out. An example might be if I were filling this out, the first call of your parents and siblings, my parents wanted me to be a doctor. Right? <laughs> like most parents probably, doctor, lawyer, engineer. To this day my mother still tells me you should go get your PhD so I can call you Dr. Omar. <laughs> she doesn't joke with it, sometimes she's very serious, why don't you do it? And so that's the pressure I, I experienced as a parent, as a, a, when I was growing up from my own parents. So please feel free to take a moment to fill that chart in. Okay. We, again, the whole point is to relate to our children and to let them know that we too have lived a life of teenage years. And just because we lived in a different country or a different time, it doesn't make it any different than today. From the time of Adam and Islam to the last person on earth to the last breath is taken by the last person on earth, Teenagers will be teenagers will be teenagers the entire time. Sometimes we as parents need to take a, take a moment to remind ourselves that we were once teenagers and we once, time gave, once upon a time gave a hard time to our parents as well, or to our siblings as well, or to our teachers as well. And we have experienced the same pressures that our, te our kids experience as well at their teenage years. Again, context might change, but the pressure is still the same. The pressure to conform, the pressure that, they are, what are they thinking of me? What are they, who are they? peers, teachers, parents, community members, what are they thinking of me? Right? There are kids who don't come to the masjid because they're worried about what the imam might think of them. Right? Or I'm not going to wear hijab regularly, they might be seeing me in the masjid and they make fun of me because I'm wearing the hijab in the masjid, but I don't normally wear hijab. This is a pressure as well. As well. So the pressures have always existed. So the point is this, we need to, over the next days and weeks to come, what I'm asking you to do as a strategy is to take this chart you've just filled out and once a week, Share a pressure from this chart with your child. Share with them, your teenager, your, even your adult child for that matter. Share with them some of the pressures that you have experienced in life. And then the next is to actually teach them. It's not enough just to share, but we have to teach. And parents are our first educators. So we share experience with our child and we might ask them, how would you have dealt with this if this was happening today? Or if you were me, you know, 30 years ago, how would you have dealt with it at that time? And then you share what you did. Maybe you share the mistakes you made so they can learn from our mistakes as well. Right? A person can never live long enough to make all the mistakes in the world. We learn from the mistakes of others. So there's nothing wrong with us sharing our humanity, sharing the mistakes that we have made with our own children so that they can learn from our lessons in life as well. And how do we share them? What exactly is the lesson we're trying to share with them? It's this word, dope. Determined to overcome the pressures of existence. You can write that down, be dope. Determined to overcome the pressures of existence. I have this hanging in my classroom at, in my classroom where I used to teach. I have it hanging in my office as a guidance counselor. I have it hanging in my home as well for my parents, for my, my parents, my kids too. My kids, sometimes my parents. My kids too also recognize as well. Being dope, okay? It's an old term from the 1980s and 90s, but it's a term that has always stuck with me as a teenager as well. Determined to overcome the pressures of existence. And this is what we want our kids to keep in mind. We want our kids to have that, that inner feeling, that, that, that motivation, that inspiration, that relies upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Dr. Zayhan has been sharing with us. You know, that whole concept that we have inside of ourselves, the energy, the desire, right? The, 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 the enthusiasm to go and and, and deal with all the pressures of the earth, 
all the pressures of, of, of life, all the pressures of existence, knowing that so long as we're determined to continue fighting, we will become the diamond that we want to be, inshallah. So this is the first strategy I would like us to share, that, that we would like us to start implementing. So this is something that you can go home tonight and start, or tomorrow morning, tomorrow's a holiday, having breakfast with your kids in the morning perhaps, sit down and, go and share one pressure and teach them how you got to where you are now. The reason that we are in this room together, the reason that we have made it through, is because all of us as adults in this room were dope when we were younger. All of us were dope, and that's why we're dope today. And we want to teach our kids how to become dope as well. So I know in some, in some instances dope is not a good word. Again, when I was young, just like wicked was actually a good word, and that's so sick man is actually a good thing. Believe me, when someone's dope, it means they're cool, all right? So we want to be dope, we want to be determined to overcome the pressures of existence. Second strategy now, okay? And this is also going to be uh, number six, part A on your, on your worksheet, we'll get to in a second. I want to explain what this concept is. When we were, when our kids were very young, and even if your kids are young right now, you're at the grocery store for example, and they start making a big fuss, I want the gum, I want the candy, buy me a bottle of iced tea, whatever it might be. They always even have those chocolates right at the checkout counter, right? <laughs> the worst pots possible. Like, I don't know why they always put it there. Just to make life difficult for parents. And when the parent is losing control of the child, what do they say? You better be quiet. If you're not, who's going to be upset? The store clerk is going to be upset. You have to be quiet. And also the child calms down. At home, you know, the child is misbehaving. Maybe they're not eating their dinner. You know, if you don't eat your dinner, I'm going to have to tell your father. Right? Mothers do that sometimes. Or fathers will say, if you, don't, you know, if you don't clean up, I'll tell your mother. So parents can also do this on each other, right? A little fear factor. Right? Maybe your child is not doing their homework and we say, well, if you don't do your homework, what's your teacher going to think? And also the child does their homework. This is called creating a third party. Okay, we absolve ourselves as parents of the obligation and we blame somebody else. If you don't do it, that's going to happen to you from that third party. I have no control of that third party. That store clerk, maybe, you know, he's going to, you know, she's going to like freak out on you and start yelling at you. You better be careful. You don't know who that store clerk is. You better do your homework. You know that teacher of yours? They might give you detention if you don't do your homework. We create this third party and that third party has an element of fear that creates anxiety, that creates that pressure. If you don't do your homework, you won't go to university. You won't become a doctor. You won't become a lawyer or engineer. And then they'll say, I don't really want to become a doctor or engineer. Because they're teenagers now, right? That doesn't work anymore. But the idea is that we, we create a false impression, this third party. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a third party. The question is, how do we use it in a positive sense? So what I want to share with you now, may or may not be part of your home life. So I'm going to share with you how to develop a third party narrative. A narrative is a story that is told over and over and over again until it becomes second nature conversation in the home. The truth is that neither you nor I, the store clerk, the teacher, the policeman, none of us are really are a true third party. The only real third party that has any control over anything is Allah. And so what we need to do in our homes is to create a narrative that makes Allah the third party. That everybody in the whole house, child, teenager, and parent, young adults in the home, all of us are held accountable to the same, to the same third party. And here's what a story might look like. Where did we come from? I'm asking you, where did we come from as human beings? I'm asking you, come on, where, you guys have to know where you came from. <laughs> from Allah. From Allah. Who was our father? Adam. Adam al-Islam. Who was our mother? Allah. Hawa. Right? This is from Surah Musa, verse 1. Ya yuhan nas at taqarubukum ladi khalakukum nafsin wahida. Our kids by the time a teenager should have memorized this and we keep this narrative up. So we came from Adam, we came from Hawa, they are our mother and our father. Where were they originally? In paradise, the gardens of Adam, right? The gardens of Eden. That's where they were. How did they get to earth? By making a mistake. By making a mistake. But who made them, who forced them to make that mistake? Shaitan, Iblis. So who is our enemy? Shaitan. Who is our only enemy on earth? Shaitan. Is George Bush or Obama or Donald Trump to be our enemy? <laughs> no, they are not. Our real enemy is Iblis. As a species of human beings, we have been gifted with only one enemy, but many friends, through the Malaika and so on. Right? But we have one enemy, Iblis. Do we like Iblis? No. What does Iblis want us to do? 
He wants to go to Hellfire. Why does he want to go to Hellfire with him? What? He's going there and misery loves company. Why is it least not like us? What did we do? Did we do something to him? We did nothing to him. Why does he not like us? Why does he hate us so much? He made a promise to Allah. He made a promise to Allah, but why, why did he... We're not like him, but he was arrogant. He was from amongst the arrogant. Now he was commanded by Allah to bow down before Adam He said, I'm, I'm, I'm better than him. He showed his arrogance. What's the second characteristic that comes after arrogance? Arrogance gets you in trouble and something keeps you there. Excuse. Pride. Arrogance keeps us in the trouble. Pride is what keeps us there. Ego. Ego is, is what leads to selfishness and anger and all those negative qualities. This is a simple narrative. So if a child misbehaves in my home, I'll ask them the question, well, why did you do something? How, I, I might say, why did you do something? But if you say, why did you do something? Why did you break the dish? Why did you yell at your sister? Why did you do something? How does the person react? Defensive. Defensive. So we'll say, how could we have done that differently? So we have to change our language. This is the narrative. We stop asking the question, why? Because the truth is, we don't know why we do something bad. It just happened. I don't know why I did that. It's, it's just, you know, there's no answer. Kid comes to me and they got to a fight. Why did you fight? They have no answer. Why did you swear? They have no answer. How could you have done that differently? Well, I didn't have to fight. I didn't have to swear.